What would happen if everyone grew up with equal opportunities? With relationships that ensured they would have folks to walk with. To open doors. To build bridges. To knock down barriers. To help fulfill their dreams. Everyone is born with equal potential, but inequities show up as gaps. Gaps in opportunities, in resources, and in access to adult relationships beyond family. Mentoring unites us. At a time when loneliness and isolation are trending upwards, we know that relationships are powerful solutions. They bring us together, navigate us to greater connection, understanding, and opportunity. Because mentoring goes beyond teaching us skills. It teaches us curiosity, empathy, humility, resilience, hope, and the power of a community to make lasting change. Change is a process. It multiplies each time someone is inspired by greater possibilities, by someone showing up for them. And it builds from one connection to the next until entire communities are moved to action. That's the power of mentoring. Both mentor and mentee grow, seeing the world through each other's eyes. Mentor activates the mentoring movement across broad and diverse sectors and organizations. And the result? Millions more young people are in supportive mentoring relationships. Mentor scales impact by developing and supporting affiliates who provide local leadership, advocacy, field building, and expertise. Providing the training, data, and coordination necessary to accelerate the expansion of quality mentoring relationships across the nation. And we build bridges and usher others into the movement through strategic partnerships. From schools to workplaces, funders to influencers, and policymakers, to invest, prioritize, and amplify the proven power of relationships. Mentor is the heart of the movement, ensuring all young people have the relationships they need to strive and thrive. Because there's no such thing as other people's children. Mentoring turns potential into opportunity. Mentor makes it possible. Join us in welcoming Gary Graham, Chair of the Mentor Affiliate Advisory Committee. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, on behalf of Mentor, its affiliates, our sponsors, and exhibitors, I'd like to welcome you to the 13th Annual National Mentoring Summit. After two years of virtual summits, it's finally good to see 1,300 attendees here and another 400 jo joining us virtually. This is an all-time high for summit attendance. This moment would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, which includes our premium sponsors, EY and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, our lead sponsors, Bank of America, Deloitte, LinkedIn, and the NFL, and our presenting sponsors, AmeriCorps and the AARP Foundation Experience Corps. Thanks to these great organizations, not only support the summit, but invest in mentoring movement all year long. Please give a big round of applause for our incredible sponsors and their investments. <laughs> Throughout the next two days, we encourage you to stop by and visit with our exhibitors. They're in the booths located on meeting level four with the most of the breakout sessions and the afternoon lunch. There will be a variety of lunch options available, including meetups with the local affiliates. Just a reminder, you can find all of these options available in your app for the summit. We're also excited to showcase youth art throughout the summit. This year, in partnership with a local DC-based organization called Life Pieces to Masterpieces. They remind us that we all enter life as a blank canvas but with love, security, expression, we can each become a masterpiece. We will learn more about them in all just a moment through our first Excellence in Mentoring awardee. To present that award and provide reflections, please welcome Nancy Altabello, Chair of Board of Directors of Mentor National. Thank you, Gary, and good morning, everyone. How, how fabulous is it that we're all together? It's been a long time. I am so thrilled to be kicking off this year's Excellence in Mentoring Awards 
which annually celebrate outstanding champions of the mentoring movement. These champions range from mentoring practitioners and influencers who have dedicated their lives to advancing our cause, to leaders in philanthropy and government who invest in and advocate for expanded opportunities for youth, to also young people themselves whose ingenuity, courage, and leadership are paving the way for future generations to come. We're so excited to share their stories of impact and inspiration with you over the next few days. Before we announce our first honorees, I do want to stop and thank the amazing group of volunteers, volunteer leaders that make up the Board of Mentor. You guys are amazing. You've stepped up in so many ways this year. Thank you for your service, your partnership, and your wise counsel. And to our mentor affiliates, supporters, partners, and everyone here today, thank you for the countless ways you have already tirelessly stepped up for our young people um, and what you're going to do today and in the future for our communities, no matter the conditions, no matter the challenges. So cheers to you. And finally, I want to share one last note of gratitude and remembrance to two champions of mentoring who we are dedicating this year's awards to, Vim Quaker and Bill Russell. Vim served as a member of Mentor's Board of Directors for 30 years, 10 of those being as the board chair. He was a fierce advocate for mentoring, a dedicated leader and philanthropist, and a passionate believer in the importance of providing young people with opportunities to learn, grow, and thrive. This past April, we had the privilege of honoring Vim as a legend of mentoring at Mentor's 30th anniversary gala. During his acceptance speech, Vim said, the cause of mentoring and the service to our organization has been one of the most fulfilling activities of my life. There is no doubt about that. And I am so pleased that I have been able to participate in the organization for more than 30 years. Sadly, we lost Vim in November. Mentor, also, Mentor is also marking the passing of founding board member Bill Russell. Bill, a legend on the basketball court and in the civil rights movement, was an integral part of Mentor since it started more than 30 years ago. And he remained steadfastly committed as a champion of the movement through the end of his life. In 2016, Bill wrote about his dedication to mentoring. He shared, the truth is that in all walks of life, mentors transform lives. Whether it's the middle school math teacher who drove you home from school every day, or the uncle who busted your chops when your grades started to slip, the older student who looked after you with a watchful eye, or the basketball coach who believed in you. None of us would be where we are today without the support of our mentors, and I'm proof of that. Both Vim and Bill will be greatly missed by the mentor community and by all of those who are fortunate enough to know them. At this summit, which shines a light on so many champions, we send love to their families and we honor their character, their resolve, and their impact. We're eternally grateful for each of their visions and trailblazing contributions to the mentoring movement. So to Vim and Bill, And now, now we're going to turn to recognizing another hero of the movement with the Excellence in Mentoring Award in Lifetime Achievement, given to an individual who has dedicated their life's work to supporting you through mentoring. At Life Pieces to Masterpieces, isn't that a great name? An organization where black boys and young men turn life's challenges into opportunities, 80-year-old William Pitts is known as Elder Bill. Grounded in his love for shared humanity, Elder Bill knows how important it is for young black men to see elders who they can see themselves in. In 1976, William began his career working with adults at the Bureau of Rehabilitation, where he was quickly inspired to shift his focus to youth and stayed for 17 years. During his time in the youth division, he directed group homes for young people who had been incarcerated, abused, or were homeless. When he managed facilities for the Bureau, the recidivism rate was almost zero, in large part due to his consistent encouragement 
and reliable presence. Once retired, William brought his training and compassion to Life Pieces to Masterpieces, where he mentors hundreds of young men and boys each year. Elder Bill is their guide and encourages the young men to be themselves with deep care and compassion. He's the definition of an exemplary mentor. He attends every graduation, often serving as a keynote speaker. He attends every funeral, offering love and support. He shows up at the hospital, providing peace and comfort. He serves as a mediator of conflicts. Elder Bill is ever present, deeply and fully. It's no surprise that William has received numerous awards throughout his career for his service, including the DC Association of Youth and Child Care Workers Presidential Award and the Distinguished Services Award from the Inter-Association of Child Care Workers. But if you've met Elder Bill, you know that the only accolades that matter to him are from the young men who he has helped to live out their dreams. William, Elder Bill, it is my honor to present you with this year's Lifetime Achievement Award. Come out here. I'd like to thank Nancy Altavello for the warm introduction. I also just want to highlight a few people right quick before we get, to get down with what I really want to say. I'd like to honor and thank uh, for being nominated for this award. I'd also like to thank Sister Mary Brown, uh, the director and founder of Life Pieces for allowing me the opportunity to become Elder Bill. I also would like to thank my supportive wife for 34 years. I also like to thank my mother, who was also my first mentor. And I also like to thank Sister Ryder, Phyllis Ryder, who was and is a professor at George Washington University for the nomination. Now, let's get down. <laughs> I am honored to be in the presence of people of like kind, having a common interest and a common taste, and that is mentoring young folks and mentoring themselves. I also like to thank to mentor for this award. Reading my bio gave you a snapshot of who I am and who I became. Mentors are very important in the community because they provide wisdom, which occurs when knowledge and application comes together in your experiences while demonstrating the courage to test out what it is, your ideas in real life, your adjustments that need to be made if need to be made. Wisdom assisted me with the ability to cultivate a peace in me, which is needed for mentoring, which allowed me to understand that I can, <clears throat> excuse me, that I am able to control what I can control and not control those things that I cannot control. But one thing that I am responsible for, that's for me showing up with my authentic self 100% of the time. Not 95, not 25, 100% of the time. This was how I was able to keep self-doubt camouflaged as burnout away from the door. Because I had to continue my calling, and it is a calling, mentoring. I know you all are aware of this cliche, children are our future. Are we? Question. What are we doing for them in the present to determine what they're going to look like in the future? As a mentor, I provide a space for mentees to nurture themselves to become more of a perfect vision of themselves. They become, and in becoming, they follow the moral mandate of their humanity. When I see a mentor doing a body of work 
to become that, that also lets me know that they can change their life challenges into possibilities. And they become mentors to themselves and to others. In my interaction with a mentee, they're also mentoring me. So let's get busy in the presence to understand what the future will look like for our children because they will become adults practicing the concept of Ubuntu. Ubuntu, I am because we are, we are because of who we are together. Ubuntu, I am because we are who we are to. I get choked up because that's very important for me. I am because we are, we are because of who we are together. So mentoring. Mentees, we need you, and we thank you for being present, and thank you for allowing a mentor to teach so that you can become a mentor and you start your teaching journey. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I am truly honored. This honor is not just for me, it's also for every person that I have come in contact and every person who also intercepted my timeline and provided me with the information to be who I became. So thank you for your time again and your attention. I honor you. Oh, wow. Thank you, my sister. Thank you. Mm. Please welcome from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, Administrator Liz Ryan. Good morning, I'm Liz Ryan from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, better known as OJJDP. Um, before I begin, I'd really like to thank Mentor for organizing this event each year and for inviting me and my staff to participate. Thank you, Mentor, for all your hard work. I'm very happy to be here today to speak to all of you. Mentoring is such a powerful tool that can help young people believe in their potential, their capacity to grow and change, and their ability to create a fulfilling future for themselves. The National Mentoring Summit is such an energizing event, and I could see all the energy in the room here. It's truly a pleasure to join you, mentors, researchers, youth leaders, policymakers, and so many others who recognize the value of mentoring to our young people and our communities. I'm proud of OJJDP's long-standing relationship with Mentor. We are especially grateful for Mentor's coordination of our National Mentoring Resource Center, which provides mentoring-specific, no-cost training and technical assistance to programs and organizations nationwide. The center is a comprehensive and reliable resource that ensures men uh, mentoring practitioners have expert assistance to resolve technical issues and easy access to the latest information on mentoring research and best practices. This enables programs to address the unique needs of the populations they serve, giving youth the best chance for a meaningful, fulfilling lives. Since 2017, the National Mentoring Resource Center has provided technical assistance to more than 1,800 youth mentoring programs. If your organization isn't one of them, you can and should be. In 2022, the center responded to more than 600 requests from mentoring programs that collectively serve more than 100,000 young people. I invite you to visit nationalmentoringresourcecenter.org where you can see a range of materials available online. You can also submit a request to mentors affiliates for technical assistance customized to your program. The need for mentoring and effective mentoring programs is more evident now than ever. Children experience constant scrutiny and exposure on social media, putting them at heightened risk for bullying, anxiety, and depression. Youth of color cope every day with ingrained racial and ethnic disparities. Young people who identify as LGBTQ endure bullying and bigotry. The opioid epidemic rages on, putting thousands of young people at risk for 
maltreatment, neglect, and trauma, and a global pandemic that has wrought three years of constant stress is still causing feelings of isolation and anxiety by our young people. Too many young people are feeling disconnected right now, and mentors can help turn that around. We know that a meaningful, lasting relationship between a young person and a trusted, responsible mentor can help foster self-esteem, promote school attendance and performance, and strengthen relationships with families and peers. And research has shown that young people with mentors are also less likely to engage in problem behaviors. When youth feel supported, they feel safe. That sense of well-being, of hope, impacts both mentees and mentors in schools and communities. The bottom line is we all benefit. Our vision for the future here at OJJDP is that, and mentoring is a big part of that, relates to three major priorities. First is serving young people at, in their homes and in their communities. Second is treating children as children. And third is opening up opportunities for young people involved in the justice system. At the heart of each of these priorities is an unwavering commitment shared across our agency at OJJDP to racial equity and fairness, and also a promise to listen to young people and partner with young people and their families who have been directly impacted by the justice system. Our work must recognize and confront the marginalization and racism that too many young people encounter every day. And we must learn from the experiences of those who know the justice system firsthand. They have expert insights into their own needs and the programs that address those needs. This past summer, OJJDP held listening sessions and town halls with stakeholders across the country, including many young people. The young people told us about the services they'd like to see expand, including mentoring programs and community-based organizations that provide mentorship. Youth advised us that we need to base programs in local communities, that we need to ask young people what they need and then tailor those local services to meet those young people's needs. We need to involve young people's families and help young people strengthen family relationships. And finally, and very importantly, we need to provide mentors because long-term, genuine relationships help young people build self-confidence, set goals, and make informed decisions. That underscores how critical your role is in this work and how much we support you. And your being here demonstrates that. So once again, thank you for your commitment to connecting young people with mentors to guide, encourage, and stand by them. Thank you. From Mentor National, Senior Director, External Affairs, Matt Meyerson. I'm humbled to serve as Mentor Senior Director of External Affairs. In my role, I get to show up to work every day and to think about how we're going to succeed in Mentor's mission of closing the mentoring gap. For the one in three young people who are growing up without access to a single caring adult mentor beyond their family. In this role, I have the opportunity to meet a lot of wonderful people. And I'm really excited to introduce the, the man who will be speaking out here with me today. I had the opportunity to first hear Jared Har Harper speak this fall. And it's an experience that I will never forget. And over the last months, really having a chance to get to know him has, has been one of the more rewarding experiences of my entire life. Jarrett is an Represent Justice Ambassador. He's been working on systems change in the foster care system, in the prison system, and is somebody that his bravery, his willingness to share his story, really has the opportunity to transcend the work that all of us do. So without anything further, I'm excited to bring Jared Harper to the stage. Right. Jared, I was intentionally very light on details in terms of your background to really give you a chance to, to share in your own words, um, if, you, if you may. Yeah, I'm grateful to be here. I'm, I'm Jared Harper. Thank you. A little bit about me. 
I ended up in the foster care system a long, long, long time ago, back when I was 17 months old. My mother, a mentally ill woman, my queen, although I didn't know her at the time, she was raped. Me and my younger brother are the product of that. I was then thrust into the foster care system. I experienced multiple foster homes. I lost count at about 48. Throughout my time in foster care, I, I was abused. I was sexually abused. I was mentally abused. I was starved. And I was treated as though I were nothing. My first abuser broke me in a way that caused me to be a runaway. I ran away from every home that they put me in. I ran away one day and I ended up meeting the neighborhood bike repairman. He befriended me. He treated me with love and kindness. He became proximate to the hurt that was imposed upon me. After loving him and caring for him and viewing him as my father, he took advantage. He started to do the same thing that my first abuser did. The love and kindness became shame and pain when he broke me. He stripped me of my innocence and he made me feel like I was less than human. He also did the same thing to my younger brother. I carried the guilt and the shame and the secret. It caused me to be a destructive, angry, violent child. It made me connect to the way in which I felt. I felt broken. I felt like I was defective. So that's how I lived my life, in a defective way. Until one day, everything boiled over and I regrettably took his life. I was then cast away by our penal system and I was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, plus 10 years as a foster youth. At the age of 16, I sat in front of a judge who told me that I was irredeemable. He told me that my last days would be spent inside of a prison. They then sent me off to a maximum, they sent me off to a maximum security prison. I'm not sure where you guys were at when 9-11 took place, but I can tell you where I was at. I was five days into my death sentence. I found myself laying on a bunk trying to figure out what had just took place. I knew that I were more than my worst act. I knew that I had to do more than just exist inside of prison, so I, I worked on myself. I forgave myself, and then I worked to find out why I was so angry, why I was so hurt. I found out that a lot of the answers were within me. I then realized that I had to do more than just heal. I had to help people. Hurt people hurt people. Healed people. We help people. So that's what I wanted to do. Thank you. So I, uh, I created curriculum. I read a lot of books and I designed programs that were gonna assist men who were gonna become our neighbors today. I put this work in with the intent of being more than my worst act. I wanted my legacy to be more than an irredeemable foster youth. So that's what I did and eventually I was granted a commutation by two governors. I then came home and I became a mentor I became an advocate, not just because, but because I had 
an experience that compelled me to be more than just a citizen. I needed to become a mentor because it's what I needed. Thank you. Now you all see why getting to know Jared over the last months has changed my life. Um, Jared, you shared with me a story about a mentor that came into your life when, when you were incarcerated. With today being Thank Your Mentor Day, is there a message you'd like to, to send to this individual and, and, and to share with our audience as well? Yes, I have two mentors, one being Ms. Elizabeth Calvin, Senior Rights Advisor at Human Rights Watch. She first wrote me when I was 23 years old. I have nothing but love and admiration for the human being that she is. She came and found me in the darkest place in my life. She loved me. She was kind to me. She met me where I was at, and she became my mentor. Everything that she poured into me has caused me to pour it into the 15 young girls that I now mentor at a foster care facility out in California. And then I'd have to thank Brian Stevenson. I am a recipient of his work at the United States Supreme Court in Miller v. Alabama. I have nothing but love for Brian Stevenson. His work, his steadfast commitment to justice, and his belief that we must apply care and not control to our youth across the country. Thank you. At Mentor, a core piece of our strategy is really focused on systems and policy change and what we can do to make our country a better place for, for every young person across the country. And we're very intentionally careful not to talk about mentoring as this panacea that can solve or fix every difficult situation. But Jared, at the same time, I'd love to hear you reflect on the role that mentors could have and should have played in your youth? I believe that had I had a mentor, I would have had an outlet, I would have had a resource, I would have had a confidant to share the secrets that kept me bottled up. It's imperative that we mentor our youth if I had a mentor, I don't believe that I would have been sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. I would have had an advocate even in that courtroom at that stage. I believe that mentors are more than just mentors. I know people say, you know, it takes a village to raise children, but I believe it takes mentors as well. powerful sentiment as we think about the society that we want to live in, the country that we want to build. What you just spoke about is, is powerful, but it's also really necessary for us if we are going to, as a society, really close the mentoring gap and ensure that every young person has access to caring adults beyond their immediate family. This needs to happen at the policy level as well. And mentors worked really hard to introduce and help draft a bill called the Foster Youth Mentoring Act. It's designed to create a grant program to expand access to mentoring for youth in foster care. We're excited that it already has broad bipartisan support. On the screens behind me, you'll see a link to sign up for advocacy alerts. I take this moment, really the emotion that Jared so bravely shared with us this morning and really wanting to turn that into action and to turn that into progress. And with that in mind, please consider signing up for these alerts and really participating in, in the change that we need to make happen at the policy level. I'd like to quickly transition from, from the foster care system into the juvenile justice system. As you've taught me through our conversations, 
youth age 16 to 20 that are tried as adults, there is a 76% recidivism rate. To me, that is a clear, clear sign of a broken system. There seems to be a lot that we as a field can do and really learn from you about the role that mentors should play for those who are in the criminal justice system and system-involved youth. Would you be willing to share a couple pearls of wisdom and some advice of, of, of what you would suggest to our field to do better for youth who are currently system-involved? One of the things that I, would, that I would add is the importance of proximity to our youth through your mentorship. We have a half a million foster youth in our foster system today across the country. 3% of them go to college, and only 15% of them graduate. That leaves 97% left. I believe when we look at our homeless population, when we look at the folks inside of our prisons, when we look at the children that's being trafficked, when we look at our mental health crisis, we see the 97%. Without those, without those statistics being, being broadcasted everywhere. I throw out those statistics with the hope that each mentor in here will become proximate to youth in a way that raises that 3%, flips it on its head to where we have 97% of our foster youth graduating from college, with 100% of them attending college. That's our job. They are not just foster youth. They are all of our youth. They are all of our children. Thank you. Jared, thank you so much for your wisdom, your grace, the perspective in which you bring to this work for the inspiration for all of us about how we can truly do our work better. That concept of, of proximity to the young people that we are aiming to serve, regardless of where they are. I reflect back about Elizabeth Calvin, the idea that she first came into your life through writing letters while you were in a maximum security prison. If a mentor can reach you there in that moment, there is no excuse for us not to be able to reach every young person across our country. And that's where we're going to get. And, and the inspiration that you give us is, is so powerful. Um, something else that I really appreciate about Jared is, is he was able to clear his entire schedule to join us for the entirety of the summit. You will see him in workshops, and he is around until after we close on Friday afternoon. In terms of that vision of being proximate, I challenge our audience to, to make sure to get to know you over these next two days, to exchange information, to share, and really excited in the community that we're able to build together. And Jared, all I can say is just thank you. The, the energy and your approach to life is something that we all can learn so much for. So, so Jared, we appreciate you, and, and thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Mentoring matters. Because being a mentor today and taking the time to show up for our young people means investing in a more connected and equitable tomorrow. It's the energy you bring, the spirit of discovery, the exchange of experiences and ideas. It's the inspiration, the intention, the actions that spark real, lasting connections.
as a mentor, you'll see that effort leads to impact in more ways than you could imagine. At a time when feelings of loneliness and isolation are rising for young people, mentoring amplifies deeper relationships and stronger communities that inspire the next generation to create a brighter tomorrow and a world of possibilities. To present the next Excellence in Mentoring Award, please welcome from Nike, Mwapwaka Makonu. I hope you didn't hear me drop the award on the... <laughs> Sorry about that. How's everyone doing today? How are you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, I, I have the privilege of having the best job in the world. I get to mobilize a lot of employees and get them out to their communities to connect and do some good work. And I am thrilled uh, to be representing Nike today and proud to partner with Mentor and many of our other youth serving organizations that focused on increasing equality, economic empowerment, and educational outcomes for today's generation. So that's all of you. So round of applause for yourselves. The next Excellence in Mentoring Award is for Impactful Philanthropy, which highlights a foundation, company, or individual philanthropists that have invested time and funds into mentoring initiatives across the nation and in their own communities. This year's award winner and Naki is an exceptional supporter of mentoring. For over a decade, Anne has invested her time, talent, and treasure through volunteer leadership as a mentor, a board member, and a mobilizer. Anne serves as the Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer at Equitrans Midstream Corporation and is the President of Equitrans Mid Midstream Foundation whose mission is grounded in meaningful engagement and philanthropic partnership to improve the lives of individuals in local communities. She also serves as a committee member for Equitrans Aspire program, a mentoring and scholarship program that provides high school students in Greene and Washington counties in Pennsylvania with support, encouragement, and guidance to enable them to gain confidence and the ability to succeed on their own. Anne's commitment to the Aspire program directly impacts hundreds of young people, with 51 students receiving $10,000 scholarships under her leadership. She has been instrumental in the program's sustainability and quality improvement, securing funding, engaging employees at all levels of the company to volunteer, and leveraging the mentorship partnership to support program uh, design and delivery. I mean, come on now. Amazing stuff, right? In addition to her programmatic leadership and engagement, Anne is a board member at the Mentoring Partnership of Southwestern Pennsylvania, where she has served on numerous committees and task force projects. In 2021, she served as the chair of Magic of Mentoring event, raising over $350,000 for mentorship par mentoring partnership. She currently serves as the board vice chair and will take on the chairperson role in 2023. So please, let's stand up if you can and say congratulations, Anne. We're thrilled to recognize your contributions with this award. Let's give a round of applause. Good morning. 
I'd like to start, start my remarks by expressing my most sincerest thanks to both Mentor and the Mentoring Partnership of Southwestern Pennsylvania for honoring me with this award. In late December, when I first received the notification from Mentor, I originally thought it was a phishing email. You have won this award, click on this link. <laughs> but after further review, I was surprised and humbled by the nomination from Colleen Fedor at the Mentoring Partnership and the selection from Mentor. My connection with youth mentoring began in 2003. I had recently started a new job in Pittsburgh, and I joined Aspire, a company-sponsored mentoring and scholarship program for high school students in southwestern Pennsylvania. As part of the Aspire leadership team and a mentor myself, I saw the benefit of what it means to create and foster caring adult connections in the lives of young people. My mentee was a high school student who had recently been through a very traumatic family experience. At that moment, as a mentor, I felt completely unprepared and unsure of myself and what I could do for her. But I learned that my role was not to be a replacement parent, but to be someone in her life that she could rely on and trust. To listen, not judge, to offer options, not directives, to reinforce all the good things in her life when things felt like they were falling down around her, and to help her to continue to look forward, not backward. While our formal mentoring relationship lasted only two years, we still remain connected today after almost 20 years. Since its inception, Aspire has graduated nearly 350 students and has given away more than a million dollars in scholarship money. Thank you. This is a result of having the financial and organizational commitment to support mentoring in our communities. And with the help of the Mentoring Partnership, we have trained hundreds of mentors who are positive, positively impacting the lives of young people in our communities. Over the years, our target student population has evolved, and we are now focused on reaching students in more rural areas, specifically targeting Greene County, Pennsylvania, where the high school graduation rate is one of the lowest in the region. We have so many opportunities in this community, and I know that our Aspire mentors are ready for the challenge and the reward that comes from making meaningful and intentional connections with young people. My commitment to mentoring extends from Aspire to the Mentoring Partnership, where I've been a board member since 2017, and I've recently taken on the role as board chair. I am committed to be a powerful voice and strong philanthropic advocate for mentoring, and I encourage everyone here to do the same. Effective mentoring programs require resources and investment. I was a better mentor because of the education provided to me by the mentoring partnership so very long ago. I am a better, met I am a better mentoring advocate because I've seen firsthand the mission-mindedness of organizations like the mentoring partnership and others who support the development and success of young people in our communities. Thank you again to Mentor for honoring me with this award, but really thank all of you who are here today to do what you do to support and promote young people through mentoring. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Mentor's Chief Impact Officer, Tim Wills. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome again to the 13th Annual National Mentoring Summit. It's so good to see so many of you here, um, both in person and then the uh, folks joining us virtually. It's an exciting two days, uh, lots of learning and engagement. Uh, but first, let's just give another round of applause for the amazing stories you've heard on the stage to this point and our excellence in mentoring um, awardees. Uh, there's more. Uh, at our session later today and our closing session on Friday, we have two more Excellence in Mentoring awardees to introduce you to um, as well. I do just also want to take a moment to just thank some 500 of you who joined us yesterday for Capitol Hill Day. You advocated in the cold, in the rain for young people 
all throughout this country. So give yourselves a round of applause for advocating on Capitol Hill so they can invest in youth uh, in our country. I'm here today because uh, Mentor is super excited today to launch a new research study debuted this morning in USA Today. Um, but this study supported uh, by our friends at EY um, called Who Mentored You? Um, its real goal was to look multi-generational at mentoring in America. And one of the big things we found was that young people today are being mentored more than at any other point in time. And in fact, when we look at baby boomers, less than 50% of them reported having a mentoring relationship. Millennials reported by seven out of 10 of them that they had an active mentor in their life. That's huge progress for this movement. It's because of each and every one of you that millennials had a mentor of quality in their life. So for that, give yourselves a round of applause as well. You're doing amazing work uh, throughout this movement. We're at a moment right now with our Gen Z generation, our youngest generation, where we're beginning to see a backslide in this process. Reaffirming this one in three young people, lack of quality mentor in their life. Now, just before COVID, this Gen Z, our youngest generation, was already beginning to report fewer mentors in their lives. And we know with COVID-19 and the global pandemic, as it accelerated the downward turn for so many things in young people's lives, it accelerated the mentoring movement's decline for this generation. So we have work to do. We have lots of work to do. Because we know for this generation that the sense of sadness and isolation and being disconnected is real and evident for every single one of them. And they need caring adults in their lives to show up and to be there for them and to be concerned about their mental well-being. Our moment is now again to respond to the need for youth and teens in America. So let's continue this conversation and bring on stage our panelists today. So I'm super excited to introduce you to both of them. Jenny Ba, she is the new Chief Impact Officer at Big Brothers Big Sisters of America, and our own Mike Geringer, Director of Research and Evaluation here at Mentor. So, welcome. welcome. Mike, you led this study, um, and really revisiting the mentoring effect in some ways as well. Um, when you think back through finding uh, the findings in the report, what surprised you most uh, in this report? Yeah, you know, you never go into these things trying to hunt for the finding that you want to get, right? And so I didn't carry a lot of preconceived notions into it, but we had done that mentoring effects study about 10 years ago. That's where we first learned that, you know, one in three young people generally were growing up without a, a mentor in their life. What I didn't expect uh, was that we would see this uh, kind of sharp decline in mm -hmm. rates of mentoring for our uh, youngest uh, members of Gen Z. Um, you know, and for those of you who don't dabble in statistics too often, you know, a six or seven percent uh, drop doesn't sound like a lot, but that translates into 10 million plus young people that uh, were not getting the mentoring. We also wanted to take a different look at that mentoring gap and kind of reframe it because mm -hmm. The problem with uh, thinking about, oh, well, you had a mentor, therefore you kind of go into this mentored bucket and we assume that it worked out for you. We also asked, were there points in your life where you really wanted a mentor but didn't have one? And we found that uh, those rates were climbing over the generations as well. Almost 70% of 18 to 21 year olds said, I could remember a time or multiple time points in my life uh, where I wanted a mentor but did not have one. Um, and those rates are steadily climbing. I, I guarantee if we were to uh, have uh, surveyed 17 to like 12 year olds, that might even be higher than that. And so for me, it really drove home the point that just when you have a mentor, one mentor may not be enough for you or they may come and go from your, your life. And so it really kind of reframed how I think about that mentoring gap. Um, 
Lastly, and I don't know if I would say I was surprised by this, but because uh, we've all read a lot about uh, the mental health needs of today's young people in the popular press, and we've all kind of seen those news stories. But I didn't expect, we asked those young people who never had a mentor, uh, what was the thing you wanted mentoring help with? And I thought it would be you know, a lot of education and career. We did see that in the, the data, but for 18 to 21 year olds, the number one thing uh, was mental health needs depression, anxiety, suicidality. Uh, that was 10 points higher than any other reason. And it was eight points higher than their slightly older Gen Z peers who were 22 to 24. So just in a short handful of years, that's a major uptick in that. Now, I think that was definitely COVID obviously played a role in that. But the overall pattern is one where these younger generations uh, of Gen Z and, and even younger, I think, uh, they understand what they're missing when they don't have mentoring. Uh, even those who had a mentor, they were more likely to say there were times when I wanted one that didn't have one. So I think we need to rethink, you know, one mentor is fantastic, but it's gonna take more than that. And so that really surprised me, but it drove home, I think, a key point for our field. So. Yeah, I think that's a really key point that, you know, one mentor, one mentor is not gonna take enough, right? It's those, as some of our friends in Southwest PA would say, it's those everyday mentors in kids' life that are gonna be really important and key. You know, Mike just talked about um, mental health and trauma that young people are facing, and we know the pandemic has really just elevated that even more for young people. Talk to us a little bit about childhood trauma, and in particular, what Big Brothers Big Sisters is doing in that realm. Yeah, thanks for having me. And the conversation is really important and very real to us. During the pandemic, um, about one in five of uh, the young people we serve uh, lost a parent or a caregiver close to them. It's so difficult. Um, and what we're talking about is leaning in, uh, leaning into a space that is something that we've done well in terms of relationship building. We all know that mentoring can help with social and emotional support. What we've done most recently is a really great initiative called Team Changing Minds. And it's really targeted, not just to the littles or the young people, but to the adults all around them. So when you bring up needing more adults in their life, you need adults that also recognize signs and symptoms around a mental health issue. Uh, the number I would say to you guys to remember is 10. 10 years is the typical of when a young person gets support for those really big issues. Um, and Team Changing Minds helps the adults around them recognize what the challenge is, be able to have those honest conversations, make it more normal, that you've got a ton of people in that ecosystem. And so that's a big deal for us to be a part of this project. Um, and we've got a lot of partners in it. And what we're trying to do is really galvanize to reach a million children over five years. And it starts with those adults, mm -hmm. making sure adults are equipped. How do I recognize something as immediately needing help? and that it would not take 10 years for this young person to get the support they need. The CDC says 79% of young adults who get mental health support say an adult in their life encouraged them to get that help. So we can really make a difference and lean in and do more in that space. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned a million more, yeah. right? A million more. So that's gonna take an army of adults it is. to meet that need and demand. And I know a lot of folks in this audience today may be struggling with finding mentors and volunteers to engage in this space. What message or ideal are, are you all using to attract folks to the mentoring field as mentors every day in kids' lives? Some of it is simple. You don't have to be perfect, just be present. Mm. That is a key message mm. that works really, really well. You've had a, heard a lot of the stories on the stage of people who shared themselves, um, their imperfections, and we're doing the same thing and encouraging adults to lean in together. The pandemic also affected adults in isolation. So we're doing a lot more, and the way we frame that is under one-to-one -one plus. How do you create an ecosystem around youth? So it is plus those great experiences. It is plus a team of volunteers or a group of volunteers that are working together with a group of young people. And so not only is the young person connected, but the adults are connected with each other. Mm -hmm. We're also using virtual mentoring in some really fantastic ways. We've got um, partners in our network who have their own app where you can not only mentor and talk one-to-one, -one, but you can reach out to another mentor. Hey, is your little dealing with this issue? So am I. 
We're also doing things where the face-to-face -face virtual piece is complemented with in-person. So really adapting to what mentors need and also being honest in the conversations to say, this is also about you. You get a lot in that relationship belonging piece uh, when you mentor. So that's doing a good job with reaching out to more adults. Yeah, absolutely. I love that plus message yeah. that you have. We found in this report, Mike, natural mentors plus program mentors have a really uh, incredible impact on young people. Talk to us more about some of the strategies around that theory of mentoring that's, that, that you found in the report. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, just uh, kind of intuitively, we know that it's uh, no one individual is going to bring all the things that a young person wants to know or needs help with or, or wants to you know, learn. Um, I think one thing that I really encourage programs to do is do some kind of relationship mapping uh, with young people, figure out what this constellation of uh, adults, that ecosystem is around a young person. I know it's very popular now to do this and kind of think about the social capital that young people have. Um, but I also think it's important to map out peer relationships as part of that. Sometimes these uh, mapped networks, you know, it's just who are the adults, you know, with, you know, connections that can kind of get you places, and that's good, right? You want to map that out. But I also think sometimes we leave out peers from that, especially, you know, peers that maybe us as adults, we look at, you know, uh, maybe we're getting into trouble hanging out with certain friends, um, and, and our message is often like, well, just stop hanging out with them. But it's like young people are hanging out with those kids because they're getting something out of it. And if we're not mapping that, if we're not understanding what even these sometimes negative relationships are bringing to a young person, we lack the ability to then step in and offer a positive version so that they can get that thing without maybe some of the side effects of it. Um, uh, so I'm a big fan of just kind of uh, mapping that ecosystem. I was talking with my research colleague, Mike Karcher, the other day. He's like, well, it's on the periphery of these maps where growth happens, right? Uh, but if you haven't mapped it, you don't know where there's room to add people to this. And so um, to me, when you get a mentor through a program like yours, you know, we're adding a very bright star to your life, right? And you may have a solar system, but I think we need to expand that out and give every child a galaxy of adults around them. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the driving force for this forward is, is exactly what you're talking about um, for mentoring as well. For the folks in the audience, what last words do you have for them about where we stand right now? We're still one in three young people um, are lacking a mentor in their life, even after we made tremendous gains mm -hmm. in this movement. What's the word for folks here who are working every day in communities getting things done? For me, I would say there's a couple of things, and, and I know, you know we've shared a little bit of bad news here, but I do want to you know, reiterate for folks, almost all the growth that we've seen in mentoring over the last 30 years has been programmatic. Those rates of kind of naturally found mentors have stayed fairly the same, uh, but really it's been the growth of our program, so uh, we need to keep that up, obviously. But I think there's more we can do to educate the nation's parents about you know, why they would want to mentor for their child, um, uh, how they can kind of facilitate this ecosystem of caring adults, right? There's a huge role for caregivers and parents to play in that, but oftentimes through our services, you know, parents are, are not as engaged as we'd like them to be. I would also just say the other thing we need to really think about as a society is uh, how can we take care of the adults? It's been a very rough decade on a lot of fronts for Americans, uh, growing inequality, political things, COVID. Uh, none of us have been able to show up as our best selves, even for our own children, right? And so uh, to me, I think we need to think about what is keeping us as adults from showing up more and better. Um, you know, these declining rates of mentoring, that's a, an us problem as adults. It's not about the young people and their, their needs. Um, and so, you know, how can we create the conditions in which people have more free time and more financial stability so that they can go out and be involved with kids in their community? Uh, it's a big picture macro level thing, but yeah. uh, I think it impacts these rates of mentoring. Jenna? Uh, I think of two words, adaptability and Ubuntu. Um, we are really interconnected, and that is the African saying, Ubuntu. Uh, I am because we are. And as long as we keep remembering we're part of a community, the work we do and the life we live at home is so interconnected to folks who we want to mentor. Um, and the adaptability piece 
is that mentors come in all shapes and sizes. That really being flexible and adapting, that the mentor you're looking for might be a 16-year-old. The mentor you're looking for might work um, across the country. And so how do we lean into that in the way that we perceive what and who a mentor is and the mm -hmm. program and the vehicles that we make available to them to really share themselves? So we're deeply interconnected. I love that. Love it. Thank you both very much for joining me today. Um, one of your seat when you came in today, there was a card, has a QR code on it, takes you directly to our website that lists the full report and an executive summary, as well as you should check out USA uh, Today uh, story on a mentoring pair in there and uh, some of this uh, information as well. For those of you who are joining us virtually uh, later today, Mike and one of our researchers uh, will be diving deeper into this report. And then for those of you who are with us in person, uh, on Friday there will be an in-person session as well to dive um, even deeper. You know, one of the other things I think is really important in this report that we um, must shout out and, and praise each and every one of you for as well is that there's been a, a real growth in equity and mentoring as well um, across the country. Uh, that wouldn't have happened if we weren't intentional as a movement um, to reach the young people who need us the most. There's still opportunity there with young people in rural areas and native lands and other communities, but we've made tremendous progress uh, to provide equity uh, in this movement. You know, as I sit here and, and listen to this conversation and, and uh, review this report, it really sits for me that my internal hope and guiding light is that every single young person, every single teen, every single young adult in our country, as they grow up to become adults and caring citizens and uh, productive citizens in our country, that we are able to approach them at any moment and they, they'll be able to answer one question immediately. Who mentored you? That's our guiding principle for every single youth and teen in America. So thank you all for the work that you do every day. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. To close out our session, I'm uh, really excited to introduce you to a local DC organization called Words, Beats, and Life. It is DC's longest running, and dare I say, dopest hip hop based arts education organization. They work every day to amplify youth voice um, and to give them the platform to use it. So please join me in welcoming Kenny Carroll III to the stage. Great, how y'all feeling? We can do a little bit better than that. Good How job, are y'all feeling today? You did good, man. Good? I love it. Word, word, word. Love it. So, um, what's up? My name is Kenny. Very nice to meet you. Um, yeah. Very nice to meet you. As was said, Thank I'm a poet, uh, I'm a teacher, I'm a host. Um, Thank you. Um, <laughs> whatever the day calls for. Um, and I'm going to read one piece for y'all. Real quick, though, I just wanted to. Um, give some shout outs and some thank yous. First off, um, thank you so much to, um, to the Mentorship Summit for uh, having me and for having you all. Can we clap one more time? Um, and also all the amazing, the amazing panelists and speakers that have come up before me um, that I got to meet backstage as well. Um, shout out to them. Um, and shout out to y'all, cause y'all are the mentors who make this thing happen. You clap for yourselves. It's nice to clap for yourselves. Um, yeah, so as was said, I'm Kenny. Um, if you are interested in any of the work I do, you can follow me at KennyC113. Um, and obviously, uh, Words, Beats, and Life at is up there as well. Um, really quickly, just because the piece I'm gonna read you um, is gonna be about one of my students, but I would be remiss if I did not shout out Words, Beats, and Life and all of the people who have led me here. Um, I am a child of so many amazing mentors, um, and I'm just so grateful. I started writing when I was in high school, and since then, um, through organizations like Words to Beats in Life, I've been allowed to bloom. 
Um, I got to be the 2017 DC Youth Poet Laureate in big part thanks to Words Be 10 Life, and I got to produce um, a book through them, which was great. Um, I have some copies of if you're interested, but um, I'm, I'm all to say I'm just so grateful for what mentors have done for me. Um, so speaking as students of yours, I'm thankful for you as well. Uh, word. Um, so anyway, poem. Um, this is for one of my students. Um, for all of my students, I guess. Um, also, y'all don't, I, I, I feel like there's such a silence in the room. Oh my goodness. Y'all don't gotta be that quiet with me, okay? I grew up in church. I know how, you know? Come on, I, I, I know how we get down. Um, if you're feeling good, say yeah. yeah. If you're feeling good, say yeah. yeah. All right, I like that. I. Right. So they pay me to come into classrooms, spin a tale about my life, and get the students to write. The administrators want me to turn their second period to Renaissance poets. That is kind of goofy, right? I, they don't ask the students what they want about the way they got up at 6 to get here at 8, about how the day hangs heavy under their eyes, about how they skip breakfast just to get here on time, about how they wonder, does any of this matter? This class or me, random guy who showed up with a prompt in dress pants and a poem under his tongue, but they don't tell you about teaching because you're not just teaching. I spin a tale Show them where dreams begin and pen ends. But the best part is not just speaking into the silence of a classroom. It's when, hey, Mr. Kenny, uh, can I read you this? Yeah. I make myself audience member, leader of the fan club. I bend my breath to a bridge and just follow my students who have these stories and these dreams that dance off the page. I don't sing, but watch my melody make praises for these kids. I make myself background chorus, hype man, corner pep talk. I make myself, I understand. Stern without the sting of judgment, I tell them, you're doing great. You're doing great. You're doing great because they are and you can do even better. I make myself mentor. I mean mentor. They don't tell you that when you start. I want to tell you about one of my students, Carter. See, after class, Carter tells me a story about how his half-brother and him found these chickens that laid golden eggs. In D.C.? When opened... They held money inside of them. Quiet, Tristan. I have to say to a boy the same age, but older than dragons and golden eggs and stories that don't click into place. Go on, Carter. And Carter explains and opens like a lily blossoming, shapes for us the glittering eggs, the empty yolks, reveals. They aren't all the same amount. Uh, if you open some, instead of 100, you might find a lonely dollar bill. Some of the kids laugh. I laugh as well. Carter and his half-brother had to collect armfuls of eggs, and each one containing a different amount, and each one golden and alive and nursing American bills. By the time Carter and his half-brother finished, he had a small fortune. Where's the money now, I ask? We spent it all. Stop capping, Tristan says, Sick of the watercolor world and stories that will not lead him to a time and place and other figures that can be believe beneath daylight. But I'm the opposite of Tristan. I'm grasping like a boy drowning for a world I can't add up. This world is just a different kind of fiction. You grow up and find everything is someone someone made up. We're in a recession of imagination, stories all made up, still tripping on plausible. A few things, we live on a pebble floating in space. Watermelon is 92% water. Angela Bassett is 64. <laughs> Have you seen Angela Bassett? 
20 new species are discovered each year, and every two weeks, one language is lost. Our ozone is a pair of skinny jeans, the way it's filled with holes. I don't even know what ozone is, but somehow it's full of holes, and life only gets smaller. Every day, someone might steal from you. Every day, you might fall in love. Carter explains and opens like a lily blossoming. Why are the flowers so pretty? Pretty like you, Tristan. Why do we make life so hard on one another when we all just want to get by? The bar is so low. Some of my students just want to survive. No one wants to be the biggest oak that gets cut down. No one wants to dream. When dreaming means molting into a memory, Carter blooms like a lily. But all day, we crush daffodils beneath our feet, and he sees the way beautiful things become the blacktop we pass. Carter speaks, and I see the way the world can make a lost language of his laugh. Later, I ask if they could wish for anything in the world, what would it be? Carter wishes his half-brother didn't die, that he'd come back. Tristan doesn't speak. I don't speak. But later, I hug Carter and I hold him a little bit longer on the way out. And he laughs and shoves me away. He laughs. We haven't lost this week. Thank you.